The first time I saw a vampire, I didn't scream, nor did I run. Instead, I wiped the blood off the floor with a mop. My name is Calvin Miller, and exactly two days after I turned 22, I found myself signing in a day thicker than my old college textbooks and accepting a job that paid too well for what seemed like simple janitorial work. The job title, Supernatural Sanitation Specialist. The reality, Cleaner of Vampire Messes. It all started with an unusual job, listing I stumbled upon while scrolling through late night job postings, sandwiched between promises of quick certs in it and truck driving gigs. Night shift facility cleaner, it read. Special conditions apply. Driven by a mix of curiosity and desperation, I clicked. The interview was at an old industrial park on the outskirts of town, past where the streetlights gave up the ghost and only the moon lit the way. The building was nondescript, every window dark, the only sign of life a flickering neon sign that buzzed private property. Inside, I met Mr. Hargrove, a man whose age was hard to pin down his sharp suit at odds with the rundown surroundings. You ever see something you can't explain, son? He asked within minutes of our handshake. I had, but I wasn't about to start that conversation. Can't say I have, I lied. Good, he nodded, not believing me for a second. Makes it easier. You won't just clean here. You'll follow incidents. Like biohazard stuff, I ventured thinking of toxic waste spills or crime scenes. Somewhat, he smirked. You could say our clients have very particular needs. They make messes normal cleaners can't handle. Blood, mostly. The last word hung in the air, heavier than the rest. Blood, I echoed. Animal accidents. Rare steak dinners gone wild. You get the picture, Mr. Hargrove explained, his tone light almost joking, but his eyes weren't laughing. That should have been my cue to leave, but the pay. God, the pay. It was more than I could make anywhere else without a degree or a decade of experience. So I signed on to be the cleaner of things though bump and bleed in the night. My first job was at a grand old house on the edge of the city. One of those places that looked like it was pulled right out of a Gothic novel complete with iron gates and ivy creeping up the walls. The willows, they called it. I thought you said animal accidents, I muttered to myself as the gates creaked open. Inside, the job was straightforward. The parlor looked like someone had thrown a particularly savage red wine party and forgotten to invite the glasses. Red splashes on the walls, on the imported rugs. Rats said the thin, pale man who let me in. Big ones. His name was Edgar, and he watched me with eyes too bright. You clean up after us, and you'll never want for anything, he promised. Or maybe warned. As I scrubbed, I caught sight of something darting past the doorway. Too large for a rat. Too silent for anything good. By the time the sun rose, the parlor was spotless the air thick with the sharp tang of industrial cleaner, masking something older, something coppery. I was ready to admit that maybe, just maybe, I was in over my head. Driving back to my apartment, the eastern sky tinged pink and gold. I thought about Mr. Hargrove's parting words. Remember, Calvin, follow the rules, and you'll be fine. What rules? I wondered. No one had given me a rule book. But as the city woke up around me, street lights flickering off, morning traffic starting to hum, I realized that this was my life now. I was the guy who cleaned up after vampires, and I really, really hoped there was a rule book somewhere. The sun hadn't fully risen when I returned to the willows, driven by a mix of curiosity and an unshakable sense of duty. As I approached the wrought iron gates, the early morning mist seemed to cling a little too closely. As if reluctant to reveal the house beyond, the willows loomed out of the fog, its dark silhouette more menacing by daylight than under the cover of night. Back again, Calvin. Edgar's voice sliced through the quiet morning air, startling me. 
He appeared from behind a gnarled oak, his pale face almost as white as the mist enveloping us. Yeah. Just making sure everything's clean, I lied, feeling a knot tighten in my stomach. I wasn't sure why I was really there. Maybe part of me was hoping to catch a glimpse of whatever I saw last night, or perhaps I was just a fool for punishment. Edgar smiled, a thin, knowing smirk that didn't reach his cold eyes. Always good to be thorough, he said, his voice smooth, almost soothing. Yet there was an edge to it that made me shiver despite the morning chill. As I stepped into the house, the air felt unusually still, as if the building itself was holding its breath. The parlor was just as I left it. The parlor was just as I left it, spotless, yet somehow never quite free of that underlying scent of decay. I decided to explore further, driven by a whisper of instinct that told me the surface had barely been scratched. I wandered through the hallways, each step echoing slightly too loudly in the empty rooms. That's when I first heard them, whispers. They were faint, almost like the rustling of leaves carried on a breeze that shouldn't exist indoors. I paused, listening, trying to make sense of the sounds. They seemed to come from the walls themselves. Who's there? I called out, feeling foolish. The house responded with silence, the whispers stopping as abruptly as they had started. Shaking my head, I continued my explorations, telling myself it was just the old house settling or my imagination getting the better of me. But as I passed a grand mirror in the hallway, I caught a glimpse of something, or someone. Flitting past behind me, I spun around, heart racing, only to find the corridor empty. The day passed slowly, with every shadow seeming to twitch and every creak sounding like a sigh. I couldn't shake the feeling of being watched. By the time my replacement cleaner arrived, I was more than ready to leave. Yet, as I walked away from the willows, a part of me felt like I was leaving something unfinished. That night, I lay in bed, the events of the day replaying in my mind. The whispers, the shadow, the oppressive atmosphere of the house. It all felt too real to dismiss as mere fancy. And the more I thought about it, the more certain I became that there was something truly wrong at the Willows. Driven by a mix of dread and determination, I made a decision. I would return to the Willows the following night, alone, to conduct a thorough investigation after dark. Whatever secrets the house held, I was going to uncover them. Little did I know, my next visit would reveal more than I bargained for pulling me deeper into the mysteries of the willows than I ever imagined possible. The morning after my unsettling experiences at the willows, I found myself unable to shake off the echo of those whispers and the fleeting shadows that seemed almost sentient. My curiosity, now intertwined with a sense of duty, propelled me towards the town's historical archives. If the willows held secrets, then the faded pages of the past might offer some illumination. The local library, a quaint building on the edge of town with ivy creeping up its old stone walls, seemed to watch me approach. Inside, the musty smell of old books and the silence peculiar to such places welcomed me. I headed straight to the historical record section, where the past lives of the town and its residents were preserved in yellowing documents and cracked leather binders. Looking for anything in particular, the librarian. Ms. Jennings asked, her voice a whisper among the quiet stacks. The Willows residence, I replied, my voice low. Missies, Jennings paused, her expression turning thoughtful. Ah, the Willows, a curious place. Follow me, she said, leading me deeper into the labyrinth of shelves. She stopped at a section that seemed older and less visited than the rest. Dust motes dancing in the slanting light from the stained glass from the stained glass windows. Pulling out a thick volume, she handed it to me with a look that I couldn't quite read. Was it caution or fear? Thank you, I murmured, flipping through the pages. The book was a record of the town's most notable events and families, and the willows featured prominently. As I read, the hairs on the back of my neck began to rise. The residence was built in the late 1700s by a wealthy merchant, 
Thomas Willows, a man reputed for his eccentricities and rumored dabblings in the occult. Over the generations, the house seemed to acquire a dark reputation, unexplained disappearances, strange accidents, and whispered tales of ghostly apparitions filled the margins of its history. One entry, in particular, caught my eye, a diary excerpt from a maid who worked at the Willows in the early 1900s. Her words chilled me. The house whispers at night, voices that weep and wail. Shadows walk where light should be, and master is consumed by the darkness. Closing the book, I looked up to find Miss. Jennings watching me, it's always been a troubled place. She said quietly, many in town avoid it. Say it's cursed. Cursed. The word hung in the air between us, heavy and ominous. Armed with new knowledge and a growing sense of unease, I decided to visit the town hall to access property records. Perhaps the legal documents would reveal more about the house's more recent history and its current owner, Mrs. Eleanor Willows. At the town hall, I was given access to a stack of files, each one detailing the legal intricacies of the Willows' ownership. Mrs. Willows had inherited the house from her parents, the last in a long line of Willows to occupy it. What struck me as odd was a series of codicils and amendments to the will, each more convoluted than the last, designed to ensure that the house never left the Willows family. Why so determined to keep the house? I muttered to myself. Leaving the town hall, the pieces of the puzzle were slowly coming together, but each piece only served to deepen the mystery. My next step was clear. I needed to return to the Willows. This time, however, I would go during the dark veil of night when the house seemed most alive, according to the diary entry I'd read. That night, as I prepared for my return to the Willows, my mind replayed the day's discoveries. The historical horrors were not just tales. They felt too real, too palpable, as if the house itself breathed a malevolent life. What awaited me at the Willows might be more than mere shadows or whispers. Tonight, I would confront whatever haunted those halls, be it ghosts of the past or something far more sinister. Little did I know, my investigation was about to take a terrifying turn, drawing me deeper into the darkness that enveloped the Willows. As dusk fell and the shadows around the Willows grew longer, my sense of unease deepened. Armed with a flashlight and a digital recorder, I approached the gates once more, my heart pounding with a mix of dread and determination. The house, with its creeping ivy and darkened windows, seemed to watch me as I entered, the silence around it more oppressive than ever. I paused at the threshold, taking a deep breath before stepping inside. The air was cool and musty, filled with the scent of old wood and a faint, unplaceable aroma that made the hairs on my neck stand. I clicked on my flashlight, its beam slicing through the darkness, casting long, eerie shadows against the walls. As I made my way through the familiar parlor, the quiet was absolute, the kind of quiet that presses against your ears, almost tangible in its weight. I set up my equipment in the center of the room, the digital recorder ready to capture any sounds beyond my human hearing. Then, I waited. Time seemed to stretch, each minute longer than the last. The house creaked and settled around me, the noises of old wood and whispered history. At first, there was nothing out of the ordinary, just the typical sounds of a house that had stood for centuries. But as midnight drew closer, the atmosphere shifted. Whispers filled the air, soft and sibilant, coming from all directions. I spun around, trying to catch a glimpse of whoever, or whatever, was speaking. But there was only emptiness. The whispers grew louder, more insistent, a cacophony of voices that seemed both distant and uncomfortably close. I pressed the record button on my device, hoping to capture the eerie sounds. As I did, a cold breeze swept through the room. The candles I had lit flickering wildly before extinguishing, plunging the room into darkness. I fumbled with my flashlight, my breath coming in short, sharp gasps. That's when I saw it, the shadow. It was a formless blot, 
darker than the surrounding darkness, shifting and undulating along the edges of my light. The air grew colder, the atmosphere charged with a palpable sense of dread. The whispers crescendoed into a single clear voice, chilling in its intensity. James, it hissed, my own name sounding like a curse from its non-existent lips. I staggered back, my mind racing. This was no mere shadow or trick of the light. This was the entity that haunted the willows, the source of all the whispers and chilling tales. It knew me. It knew my name. Why are you here? I managed to ask, my voice barely above a whisper. To show you, it replied, its voice a mixture of many, male and female, old and young, all intertwined into one, to reveal the truth hidden in the dark. I swallowed hard, trying to steady my nerves. What truth? I demanded, though part of me wasn't sure I wanted to know. The truth of what you seek. The truth of what lies buried in the heart of the willows, it said, the room growing even colder, my breath misting in the air. Without warning, the shadow surged forward, enveloping me in darkness. I felt a sensation of falling, the ground seemingly slipping away beneath me. Visions flashed before my eyes, images of the house through the ages, scenes of sorrow and darkness, of whispered secrets and hidden pain. When the vision ceased and I found myself back in the parlor, the shadow was gone, shaking and disoriented. I grabbed my recorder, eager to leave the oppressive atmosphere of the house. As I turned to go, a small, leather-bound book caught my eye, lying innocently on a side table. I picked it up, a diary, the entries dating back over a century. With the book in hand, I left the willows, the night air feeling like a reprieve after the suffocating darkness inside. The house had revealed part of its mystery, but I knew this was only the beginning. The diary would hold more answers. Of that, I was certain. The drive home was a blur, my mind reeling from the encounter. The Willows wasn't just a house. It was a nexus of sorrow and secrets, and now, it seemed, it was part of me too. As I arrived home, the first light of dawn creeping across the horizon, I knew one thing for certain. My investigation had to continue. The truth was close, hidden in the pages of the old diary, whispering through the ages. And I would uncover it, no matter the cost. The toll of the last few nights began to wear heavily on me. Each shadow at the corner of my vision seemed to twitch with secretive life. Each whisper of wind felt like a murmur of distant voices. Despite the exhaustion that clawed at my mind and the circles darkening under my eyes, sleep eluded me. The diary I had taken from the willows lay open on my desk, its pages filled with hurried, scrawling text that spoke of despair and madness. I found myself visiting the cafe in the heart of town more frequently, seeking the mundane buzz of everyday life to drown out the eerie silence of my apartment. It was there, amidst the clatter of dishes and the murmur of conversations, that Officer Sarah Langley found me, her expression etched with concern. James, we need to talk, she said, her tone serious, pulling up a chair across from me. I could only nod my gaze likely as haunted as my thoughts. It's about these visits to the willows, she began, her eyes searching mine. I've seen you change these past weeks. You're obsessed, and it's not healthy. You're chasing shadows, literally. I bristled at her words, the defensive part of my mind ready to dismiss her worries. But the fatigue and the surreal experiences I couldn't explain away gnawed at my resolve. Sarah, there's something going on in that house. It's, it's not just an old building. There's something alive in there. Sarah sighed, her expression softening. Her words stung with the sharpness of truth. I knew how it looked, how it sounded. The rational part of me agreed with her. Yet the pull of the mystery was too potent, an addictive puzzle that threatened to consume me. I can't, I admitted feeling a mix of relief and despair at voicing the admission. Not yet. I'm so close to understanding something crucial. 
It's like the house, and whatever's in it knows me. It's showing me things, Sarah. James, that's what worries me, she replied, her voice low. I've covered for you more than once when questions came up about your night wanderings. People are starting to notice, and not just me. What if you're wrong? What if it's all just the house playing tricks on your mind? I looked away, unable to meet her gaze, her words echoing my own doubts. What if I'm right? I countered softly. We sat in silence, the weight of the conversation settling around us like the early morning fog. Finally, Sarah stood, her hand resting briefly on my shoulder in a parting gesture of support and warning. Just be careful, James. Don't let this obsession destroy you. Her departure left me brooding, her words mingling with the whispered voices from the willows. That evening, as the sun dipped below the horizon, painting the sky in hues of dying orange, I found myself drawn once again to the cursed residence. The air was chillier than usual as I stepped through the gates, the diary tucked under my arm. The whispers seemed to welcome me back, a sinister greeting that made my skin crawl. Tonight, I intended to delve deeper into the attic. The stairs creaked under my weight as I ascended, the beam of my flashlight cutting through the thick darkness. The attic door was before me, daunting, its surface marred by age and neglect. I pushed it open, the hinges groaning in protest. The room was cluttered with old furniture, covered in white sheets, each silhouette like a ghost in the dim light. I moved slowly among them, the air stale with the scent of decay and old secrets. The diary lay open in my hands, its pages fluttering as if in a non-existent breeze. I began to read aloud, the words seeming to stir the spirits of the house. Shadows danced along the walls, coalescing into forms that were almost human, their whispers growing louder, more desperate. They were the echoes of those who had lived and suffered within these walls, their pain preserved in the oppressive atmosphere of the room. Hours passed as I immersed myself in the tortured history of the Willows, each account more disturbing than the last. My head ached with the barrage of spectral voices, the room spinning around me in a macabre dance of shadows and whispers. And then, silence. A suffocating, heavy silence that felt like a blanket thrown over the world. In the stillness, a single whisper cut through, clear and menacing, chilling me to the bone. Enough. I froze, the word resonating in the very fibers of my being. A cold dread settled in my stomach as I realized the voices weren't just echoes. They were warnings. I gathered my strength and fled the attic, the house seeming to release me reluctantly, its whispers trailing me as I stumbled into the night. Outside, the cool air felt like salvation. I leaned against my car, gasping for breath, the diary clutched tightly in my grasp. The truth of the willows was more horrifying than I had imagined a nexus of historical agony and supernatural malice. As I drove away, the rearview mirror reflected the silhouette of the house, a dark sentinel against the night sky. But it wasn't just the house watching me. In the glass, a shadowy figure watched me go, its gaze piercing even through the reflection. I had come too far to turn back now. The willows wouldn't let me, even if I tried. The breaking point was behind me, Ahead lay only the descent into the darkness I had only begun to uncover. As the days blurred into one another, the boundary between my reality and the haunting world of the willows began to dissolve. My nights were consumed with reading the ancient diary I'd found, each page pulling me deeper into a past marred by tragedy and darkness. The diary belonged to Jonathan Willows, a distant relative of the current owner who had documented his descent into madness in the late 1800s. His words resonated with my own fears, a mirror reflecting back my growing obsession. One passage in particular haunted me. The house feeds on our fears, magnifying them until they consume us. I fear I am not long for this world, for the willows has ensnared my soul.
This ominous message reverberated in my mind as I made my way back to the willows under the cloak of night, driven by an insatiable need to uncover the truth, regardless of the cost. My entry into the house was met with a chilling silence, a stark contrast to the whispers that once filled its halls. With only the light of my flashlight to guide me, I ventured deeper into the mansion, each step heavy with dread. The air was thick with the scent of decay, a palpable reminder of the house's long and troubled history. I found my way to the attic, the heart of the haunting, where I'd felt the most intense presence. The door creaked ominously as I pushed it open, the darkness inside seeming to swallow the beam of my flashlight. I set up my equipment with trembling hands, the digital recorder's red light piercing the gloom like a warning. As I settled in to wait, the oppressive silence was suddenly shattered by a low moan that echoed through the attic. My breath caught in my throat as shadows began to coalesce in the corners of the room, forming into the distinct shape of a woman, her features twisted in anguish. I recognized her from Jonathan's diary descriptions. It was Elizabeth Willows, his wife, who had vanished without a trace one winter's night. Her spectral form approached me, her eyes hollow pools of despair. Leave this place, she whispered, her voice a hollow echo of life. You cannot save yourself. But I couldn't leave, not yet. I needed answers. What happened here, Elizabeth? I asked my voice steady despite the pounding of my heart. She paused, her form flickering like a candle flame in the wind. The house. It takes what it needs. We are all prisoners of its desires. Determined to break the cycle, I pressed on. How can I free you? Elizabeth's form became more agitated, her whipper urgent. Find the heart of the house. Destroy it. Before I could ask more, she dissolved into the air, her final words a mere whisper carried away by the silence. Left alone in the dark, I was more determined than ever to end this nightmare. Armed with new purpose, I searched the attic, moving aside old furniture and dusty drapes. It was then that I stumbled upon a hidden door, cleverly disguised to blend seamlessly with the wall. With a mix of trepidation and resolve, I opened it revealing a narrow staircase spiraling downward into darkness. Descending the stairs, the air grew colder, and I could feel the malevolent presence of the house intensify. At the bottom, I found myself in a small, stone-walled room that pulsated with a dark energy. In the center stood an ancient altar covered in arcane symbols and stained with what looked ominously like dried blood. On the altar lay a book, its cover bound in a strange leather that seemed almost human. As I approached, the shadows around me stirred, and I could feel the eyes of the house upon me. I opened the book, and the room filled with the screams of the damned, the cries of every soul the willows had consumed. The words on the pages glowed with an unholy light, revealing the true nature of the willows. It was not just a house. It was a sentient being, feeding on the fear and sorrow of its inhabitants to sustain itself. I knew what I had to do. I took the book and the diary, preparing to destroy them both in the hopes of ending the curse. As I set about my task, the house trembled, an unearthly roar filling the air as if it were in pain. The task was harder than I had anticipated. As I burned the books, the spirits of the house swirled around me, their faces twisted in pain and anger. But amidst the chaos, I felt a strange sense of relief, as if the house itself was finally exhaling after centuries of suffocation. When it was done, the house fell silent, its oppressive presence lifting like a fog. I left the willows that night, feeling a weight lift from my shoulders. The sun was rising as I reached my car, the first light of dawn signaling a new beginning. The willows, for the first time in centuries, was just an ordinary house, but the story doesn't end there. The experiences at the Willows had changed me, leaving scars that no time could heal. I knew that while I had freed the spirits trapped within its walls, 
the darkness that lived there might one day awaken again. As I drove away, the silhouette of the willows receding in my rearview mirror, I knew that this chapter of my life was closed. But I also knew that the darkness, once awakened, is never fully vanquished. It lies dormant, waiting for someone new to awaken its hunger. And so, I keep watch, ready to return should the shadows rise once more. The dawn that greeted me after my harrowing night at the willows was tinged with a quiet, uneasy peace. The shadows that had clung so tenaciously to the corners of my vision began to dissipate, yet the echo of whispered voices lingered, as if reluctant to fully release their grasp on my consciousness. I knew that this respite might only be temporary. The final confrontation loomed large, an inevitable culmination of my entanglement with the willows. With the ancient diary and the remnants of the sinister book destroyed, I hoped the malign influence of the house had been curtailed. Yet a deep, gnawing sense of unease propelled me back to the willows for one last visit. This time, I carried with me more than just tools for investigation. I brought items of personal significance, symbols of my own past and pain, perhaps as a way to confront the house with its own mechanisms of horror. As I stood once more at the imposing iron gates, the morning mist swirled around my ankles, the air thick with the scent of decay and forgotten things. The house loomed before me, its windows dark and inscrutable, yet it seemed less foreboding in the light of day, almost as if it were merely an ordinary residence. Stepping inside, I was not met with the oppressive silence of the previous nights. Instead, a low hum filled the air, a sound that seemed almost like a sigh of resignation from the house itself. I made my way to the heart of the house, the attic, where I had faced Elizabeth Willow's spirit. The stairs creaked underfoot, familiar yet foreboding. The attic was bathed in the soft light of morning, dust motes dancing in the sunbeams that pierced through the small attic window. The room was empty now. The room was empty now. The ominous presence that had once dominated it seemingly withdrawn. I placed the items from my past. A worn photograph of my family. A cherished book from my childhood. And a small, simple crucifix inherited from my grandmother. In a small circle in the center of the floor. Sitting before these objects, I began to speak aloud. Not to the house, but to myself. I recounted the memories associated with each item weaving a tapestry of personal history that felt starkly at odds with the dark narrative of the willows. As I spoke, the atmosphere in the attic shifted, the air growing warmer, lighter. Then, unexpectedly, the shadow appeared, not as the menacing, formless presence I'd encountered before, but as a more defined figure, its edges less jagged, its essence less terrifying. It stood at the edge of my circle of light, watching, listening. Why do you return? It asked. Its voice no longer a chilling hiss, but a weary, almost human whisper. To understand, I replied simply. To end this cycle of fear and sorrow. The shadow paused, its form flickering slightly. You seek to heal, not just to confront. Yes, I acknowledged. Both this house and myself. The shadow seemed to consider this. Then slowly, it approached the circle, stopping just at its edge. Your pain is not unlike the pain that feeds this house, but you choose to face it, to use it not as a weapon, but as a bridge. I nodded, feeling a strange kinship with this entity that had once seemed so alien, so threatening. Can you be free? I asked, a hopeful note in my voice. I am bound to this place, as are all the souls that have suffered here. But your actions, your willingness to confront and understand, they bring a measure of peace. It is a beginning. Encouraged, I extended a hand, not to touch the shadow, but as a gesture of goodwill. The shadow regarded my hand, then in a moment charged with significance. It reached forward its form dissipating into a mist that briefly enveloped my hand before disappearing altogether. 
The room was suddenly just a room. The oppressive, haunted atmosphere of the willows was gone, replaced by a feeling of just emptiness. Standing, I collected my personal items, the weight of history and horror lifted from them. As I exited the willows, I felt a sense of closure, of a chapter definitively ended. The house behind me was just a structure of wood and stone, no longer a repository of supernatural dread. I knew that the stories of the willows might not end with me, that others might find their way to its door, drawn by curiosity or driven by darker motives. But my story, my chapter, had concluded. Driving away, I glanced in the rearview mirror. The willows receded into the distance, its dark silhouette swallowed by the light of a rising sun. I felt a lightness, a clarity I had not known for a long time. The road ahead was uncertain, but it was mine to travel, free from the shadows of the past. And so, with the diary's secrets burned to ash and the whispers silenced, I moved forward, carrying only the lessons learned and a heart lighter than it had been in years. The willows remained, a silent sentinel on the hill, but its hold over me was broken, its secrets laid bare, and its power over me, dissolved in the light of understanding and resilience. Thanks for listening. If you like the story, don't forget to like the video and subscribe to the channel, and I look forward to your comments. See you in the next video.